Hi, good day. Welcome, everyone. I hope you are enjoying the summit so far. My name is Allison, and I'm a product designer at Course Hero, and I'm very excited to welcome you to the session, Closing the Gap, Addressing the Absence of Black Faculty in Higher Education, which will be led by Dr. Crystal White, Assistant Professor of Teaching at the University of Memphis, and Dr. Bridget Turner Kelly, Associate Professor and Graduate Program Director of the Higher Education, Student Affairs, and International Education Policy Program at the University of Maryland, as well as the Diversity Officer and Chair of the Council of Racial Equity and Justice in the College of Education. We hope this session will inspire folks to share ideas with one another. Throughout the session, we will welcome questions, comments, and feedback in the chat, um, in the Zoom chat there. Uh, so please join me now in welcoming Dr. White and Dr. Turner Kelly. Thank you so much for joining us. All right. Hello, everyone. Ooh. Not sure if it's morning, afternoon, or evening <laughs> for you, but we do welcome you. Yes, welcome, everyone. It's great to have so many folks here. All right. And so before we actually get started, we're actually going to kick off by um, letting you know that this is going to be an engaging um, webinar today. And so we're actually going to kick it off with our very first poll. So as you guys uh, come in and get settled, um, we're going to ask you our very first poll question, which is really just a pulse check. So on a scale of one to five, how would you rate the level of support and mentoring for Black faculty? With one being the lowest and five being the highest. Look at those answers coming in. So far I see one five, which is really great. <laughs> <laughs> lots of twos, lots of threes. All right, so we got about 85% of you guys um, already participated. Thank you so much for your participation. I am going to end this particular poll right now and sharing the results with you guys. Um, for the majority of you, you believe that um, on a scale of one to five, the level of support and mentoring for Black faculty is about a two. Um, so that is rather low and that is consistent with what, um, with what we have um, researched um, and found. All right, so now we're gonna actually go and we're gonna do one more poll before we give you just a complete overview of, um, of the rest of our webinar. All right, so question two deals with the bait and switch experience. So this question asks, um, have you ever experienced a rigorous level of recruitment and assigned a mentor but not supported enough to be retained within academia or your particular institution? Lots of yeses, a couple of no's. So I'm not sure, so maybe. <laughs> All right, I'm gonna go ahead and end it here. So if you didn't get a chance, maybe once we um, can pull you guys in, you can share. All right, sharing the results. Couple people, uh, majority are saying no, that they have not um, experienced the bait and switch experience um, from recruitment to, um, you know, uh, onboarding and retention. Um, and I find that rather interesting because yeah. uh, uh, Dr. Refreshing. Kelly and I have kind of found some different. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, let's uh, go ahead and move on. As you know, um, we are discussing closing the gap, addressing the absence of Black faculty in higher education. Um, as you could see on the very first slide, there was a QR code that will give you access um, to this slide deck. Dr. Dr. Turner Kelly? Yeah, so welcome everybody. Thank you so much, Crystal, for doing some polls and we're hoping to um, you know, just have this be an engaging format. We know we're on Zoom, but we wanted to try to connect with you as, as many times. So we'll have a couple more polls coming up. Um, but first, we're, we'll talk um, about our stories a little bit and really the themes of that we're going to hit our recruitment, retention, and mentoring of Black faculty in academia. Um, but we'll talk about salary benefits and counter offers. We'll talk about invisible and unpaid labor to diverse students, um, unequal distribution of work, tenure battles, and a lack of safe spaces, to name um, just some of the reasons why we saw the first poll that, you know, we need more support um, than we're getting in academia as Black faculty. All right. Well, 
I'm actually going to stop share or pause share for right now um, because we don't really need this at this moment, um, but you will see it come back up as we get to talking about different types of um, mentoring. Um, and so we're actually going to take a look and just pause for just a second, Allison, if you could just check the Q&A and or chat to see if there are any just uh, preliminary questions that we can kind of get out of the way before we start sharing our stories and open up the next poll. Thank you. Yeah, um, I see there's an interesting point just that's been in the chat uh, added about someone sharing their experience of feeling similarly, not feeling the support and mentoring. So thank you for sharing that. Um, and there's a question that's been added too about this latest ruling to overturn affirmative action and how that might affect um, Black learners and, and educators as well. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you for, for sharing that. The current state is already not good for Black um, students and college students. Our enrollment is low um, across the board, and it's one of the few that hasn't bounced back after um, the global pandemic. And of course, we all were experiencing the racial uprisings and kind of global attention that was paid to what systemic things were already going on in terms of the, the um, anti-Blackness and anti-racism. And so it's definitely going to affect Black faculty because part of why most of us, some of us became faculty was to support um, Black and underrepresented and marginalized students. And so the fewer we have, I think the fewer support and the fewer um, positive experiences are going to come from Black faculty, but we can talk about some of that in our stories. And I really love the question that I just so quickly glanced at for a quick second. Um, there was a, a participant or an attendee that asked, you know, is this only um, focused on Black faculty or um, Brown as well? And so thank you so much for, you know, identifying yourself um, and joining us. It does include um, both. Um, or all, we, we may even share some um, stories and some examples um, of other groups um, that aren't you know, necessarily um, ethnicity um, identified. Uh, so thank you for asking that question. All right, um, so I'm gonna move to our poll question three um, before we kind of get into some of our uh, shared stories. So question three, ask about basic needs. So have you ever left an institution due to the culture or community um, and your personal life needs? So in other words, you know, not really getting the support or advice or um, guidance on kids' schooling, neighborhood, um, you know, not really knowing where to go for uh, religious um, practices or, you know, knowing where to go within the community um, to take care of your personal needs. Seeing several yeses. Exactly, Margaret, thank you for that. Right now we're looking about split. Yeah, just a slightly edge for, um... Hopefully we can leave it open a little bit longer, about eight seconds we'll leave it open for just to get um, as many people as possible to, to answer. It's looking like a slight edge over people leaving due to um, not the institution not addressing culture, community and personal needs. So sometimes the literature shows that the campuses may be doing what they can to diversify and have culturally competent, multiculturally competent folks um, in their staff and administration, but when you look at the out, outer community, um, is it able to support if people have children? Um, and are they gonna be safe in their schools? Um, is your neighborhood supportive, whether you're living on or off campus? Um, are you able to go to the religious organizations or denominations that you would feel comfortable um, worshiping in? Have you been able to find hairdressers? So things that um, sometimes institutions neglect um, and don't think about when they think about recruitment of not just, as Crystal said, not just Black faculty, but brown, Black, and marginalized, minoritized identities. Exactly. So we're at about 76% of um, people who participated. Thank you so much for those who did. Um, I'm going to go ahead and end the poll. Majority says yes at 51%, um, but following close behind, a couple people are saying no. Um, I do see here in the chat where uh, Shauna has actually stated that when I realized it wasn't a school I would attend or send my kids to, it was mm. time to go. And I can uh, totally um, understand that. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you for, for doing that. All right. So since, um, since we have... Um, 
attendees already sharing their stories. Um, Bridget, how about we start sharing some of ours? Um, would you mind sharing an experience that you had with um, recruitment? Yeah, absolutely. So sometimes um, I think people think that Black faculty or minoritized faculty won't go to certain places, but uh, my partner and I were very successfully re recruited to uh, overwhelmingly white institution and we call overwhelmingly white like less than five percent um, people of color um, on campus and just pulled out all the stops so when we arrived on campus I think I met every black person that they could find to make sure it was on my calendar whether that person was in the diversity office or whether they were in the um, administration office in the dean's office because I, I didn't have any core faculty that I'd be working with that were black um, but community members um, and letting me know, hey, this is where you can get your hair done if you so choose. I even found um, a Black woman um, priest and, and person that we could go to church with and worship with. So we decided to come um, and really had an, a wonderful, um, for the most part, experience. They were able to recruit other folks um, with us in terms of my partner was in the administration. So in terms of staff and students, when I got there, there was only one student of color across two cohorts of master's students. And by the time we um, left, we were there for four years. There was a cohort of 50% students of color and about 35% staff of color. And so that was kind of just a positive recruitment story um, for being at a place that most people would think it would be really hard to attract Black faculty. What about you? What's a recruitment story you have to share, Crystal? Well, Bridget, I'm going to um, share something. Actually, I can see in the chat that um, Dr. Uh, Tiana Bosley actually shared um, something very similar to um, my experience, which is that some universities don't necessarily make um, living near them feasible. So only those that are maybe like in the executive or upper level uh, mm -hmm. faculty can actually afford to, you know, like move um, close by or nearby. And um, I can definitely say um, that I agree with that. Um, and so when thinking about an experience I had with recruitment, um, I definitely felt warm, welcomed, um, and supported to join that institution. Um, you know, on the front end, um, definitely was looking forward to um, the relationships that I would potentially build um, there just financially. And then just the way that the, <laughs> the economy has totally shifted. Um, it made it really, really challenging to, you know, to see that become a reality for me. Um, mm -hmm. And so with that being stated, it's it's also, you know, um, you know, somewhat disheartening because, you know, you really see yourself there. They really want you there. It's a really good fit. Um, but if you can't make it um, financially happen, you know, you do have to, you know, kind of weigh your pros and cons there. Um, yeah, absolutely. Because um being whole people and being able to um, get paid what we're worth, being able to afford the things that we need, being able to live at home in a home that we feel comfortable in. Um, I know for me as a faculty member, I spend a lot of time in my home writing, reading, you know, doing things like this. And so you need a space where you can do that. And fortunately, not every place is around the country, around the U.S. If you're looking in U.S. institutions, is going to be able to do that. What about um, retention? How would have you a story you can share about how you've been retained at an institution so far? So I'm actually going to kind of piggyback and kind of couple both um, recruitment and retention, because as mentioned before, although it may not have been economically feasible to, you know, make that move and, you know, continue with that, you know, very supportive um, recruitment, what I can say was that right before I got ready to give my final no, I reached out to a couple of the colleagues um, and and um, just as a word of advice, you know, reaching out even to the HR department and just saying, mm -hmm. hey, you know, I'm really trying to make this happen. You know, do you have any resources or do you have anyone who has been in a similar experience? And what you will find is, you know, just kind of slightly making yourself just a little bit vulnerable and, you know, opening up that door for, you know, clear, transparent communication um, definitely provided additional outlets and additional resources. So oh, if you're not aware, um, maybe your university or your institution um, partners with other institutions and housing may be available through that avenue and or maybe there's sublets available. Um, and so there's a couple of other, you know, like 
ways and avenues to kind of make that happen. And I felt like that was a good way to kind of retain me even before I completely onboarded. And mm. I was like, wow, you guys are doing a really amazing job um, to make sure that like I stay he- happy, healthy, whole, right. while also making this a reality, right? So that was a beautiful example of both rigorous recruitment, but also a way to already show me that you value me from the front end. Absolutely. Yeah. All right, yeah, and I can share because I saw someone in the chat was asking kind of how did we do that in terms of um, increasing the students and the staff of color and by this point, faculty of color at that institution, because um, I was the first one to be I think a faculty of color at, ever at that that program I was at. Um, so I think one of the things we did was was really push the university and say, um, this is one of the top programs in our field. And excellence has to be inextricably tied to diversity. And, and so if you're going to say you're number one, two, or three program in the field in this area, how can you say that when you were not inclusive um, and in creating this exclusive environment? And so really working hard on professional development, bringing in speakers to talk to faculty, to talk to administrators, to talk to the dean, working in collaboration with the diversity and equity office um, so that if people are coming to campus, they would have a more positive experience. Um, and then talking to students about, you know, here's the things that we can do. We basically my partner and I opened up our home. <laughs> here's a safe space to hang out, to do brunches, to celebrate birthdays. Um, we're going to support each other. And, you know, almost like it was a two-year program, master's program. So you can do anything for two years if you have a community. And here's um, we would go to, you know, other cities close by a lot if we needed a real cultural fix um, away. But that ties to my retention because at the end of four years, it was exhausting. And it felt like we were putting out more and more of our time and our resources and our energy. And we weren't getting the, the return back from the institution. And um, almost all of this, those staff um, and students, of course, left. Um, for different reasons. And so we weren't able to be retained past, you know, four years because of the amount of energy and time and work and resistance that we got from um, internal and external people for trying to diversify both faculty saying like, wait a minute, this means I'm going to have to teach my class differently if I've got these students of color in my class who are asking me questions about curriculum um, and staff saying, wait a minute, I've got to figure out, you know, some more culturally competent skills if I'm not going to call Crystal Bridget and Bridget Crystal because I'm just seeing color. I'm not used to having these different um, people in my classroom. So I think the retention and the recruitment have to be tied together because like we said, with the poll, you get a bait and switch where we're getting people in, but they're not able to be um, retained because of the amount of emotional labor that folks are putting in to keep institutions uh, to their word if they say they're going to be socially just. Should we get to the, um, I think if we launched the poll four, we can talk about um, mentoring too and talk about some of our stories with that as well. Yeah, so I'm actually going to go ahead and reshare my screen so that way you guys can kind of see the different types of mentoring um, that are available so that the poll makes a little bit more sense to you. All right, so there are about seven different types of mentoring available, right? So you have formal um, kind of match mentoring based on like an institutional assignment, informal, which is a little bit more conversational and casual. Um, and it could be any combination um, of mentor mentees, um, traditional, which is more coaching style. Um, and that can be one on one or group. Then you have the apprentice apprenticeship model, um, which is more of a um, more of a guided mentoring um, with some kind of like on the job type of support. And, you know, you're going through scenarios and examples. The phone a friend model um, is, is more of a peer to peer um, and, and it can be um, when needed. It can be, you know, with a long standing faculty member, or a new faculty member or, or two new faculty members, um, a couple of different faculty dynamics there. The helicopter model is exactly what it sounds like. Um, it's it's a, a later career faculty member or an administrator um, that kind of works with an earlier um, career faculty member on a one-on-one, -on -one, um, like kind of a step-by-step or procedural method um, from start to finish through tenure and promotion. Um, and they just kind of come in and kind of hover um, from time to time. <laughs> Reverse model sounds like what it is. Um, it, 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 
completely flips the traditional model um, where an early career professional is also providing um, expertise and insights to a later career model. So just thinking about your own experiences, I'm going to go ahead and launch poll question four. And this question asks, which mentoring model has worked best for you? And if you've never experienced um, any of these um, mentoring types, um, that is an option as well. Thank you for going over those. And, um, and again, Allison, thank you so much for putting in the link so people know that they can access these slides um, of which this, this um, information on mentoring is in there. So you'll have access to this after the webinar today. So sometimes we just say mentoring and it feels like there's just one type, but thanks to Crystal. <laughs> for culling all this together, many, many different types of mentoring. So I see lots of informal mentoring. Um, let me scroll up. Not so much formal mentoring. And um, to be quite candid with you, that does not surprise me at all. Mm -hmm. Yeah, me either. I haven't found the formal mentoring to be a good, good model. When I have been matched, it hasn't been a good match. Um, but when I've or to seek someone out on my own, that's been a much better. And I was glad you put the reverse model in here too. I only see a couple of people in there, but that's something that I feel like as I'm reflecting that I did when I got to that environment where it was overwhelmingly white and I felt like I had to mentor some of my more experienced, long-serving faculty about how to be more inclusive, how to change curriculum, how to approach um, having a more diverse um, student body. Exactly. And I love that. And so as we're at about 75% um, of participated um, members on this poll question, I am going to say that I agree um, with the majority here. The best mentoring um, that I've experienced to date has been more of the informal mentoring um, and more of the phone a friend. I'm just literally calling people at different <laughs> institutions um, and just finding out um, what is going on in academia. All right, so I'm going to share the results. At 43%, um, we have informal mentoring. And then close, following close behind, we have um, a combo of both uh, traditional coaching um, or the phone a friend model. And the uh, experience, I think, oh. Is right there. I've not experienced any type of mentoring, um, which is really unfortunate. Especially so, first of all, um, before we kind of um, turn it over to our last um, poll question and, and do some questions with folks, what's a mentoring story that you've got to share? Oh, okay. So I'm going to go with the with the informal mentoring. Um, and so as, as we both mentioned, we were initially assigned a formal mentor. Um, and I absolutely love my mentor that I was assigned initially. Um, we're really great colleagues. Um, and we've, uh, you know, just shared some different things. However, I found that I really kind of needed to reach out to that mentor more on an individual basis or, you know, as need. Um, and so that quickly became less formal and more informal. Um, additionally, I began to seek out um, mentors that were not necessarily assigned to me, um, but that could offer me um, particular advice or support on specific issues or um, concerns that I may have had. And that seems to have worked. Um, it just seemed like certain individuals, certain faculty members had some expertise in this area, whereas I would have to reach out to a different, um, you know, a later career faculty member for other advice or expertise just based on their experiences. What about you, Bridget? Yeah, I definitely, um, like the poll, I have done more informal um, and really found my, my main mentor by taking a class with her and then following her after the class back to her office and asking her, not, not first to mentor me, but um, to advise me, you know, academic advisor, but then it's turned into a mentoring um, relationship of over 20, 20 plus years of 
um, both phoning her when I needed to, kind of being more situational um, as I'm thinking about different positions. Um, and now we get to work together quite quite closely. And now I get to watch how she gets grants and how she connects with um, foundation and nonprofit and how she communicates with our department chair and our dean. And I feel like every time she does that and I'm able to be in the meeting, I'm getting mentored about how to do those things as well as how she relates with her students. And so it's been an incredible experience, but I don't think it was ever would have ever been one that an institution would have set up because they would have said, oh, she's a, she was in her first year of assistant professor um, when I was a PhD student. And I don't think they would have, first of all, they wouldn't have set up a mentoring relationship between a student and a faculty member, which is problematic. But also, even when I became a or even when I got my first faculty role, um, that people might have thought she was too new or didn't really know what she was doing, which was far from the case. So I think finding your own, telling telling supervisors, telling department chairs, telling deans what it is you need, and being flexible about getting that on campus, off campus. Um, there's so many things now you can do online or conferences that you can meet with people. So it doesn't have to be, you know, if this person's not on my campus or not in my program that I can't um, have a mentor, but really have to know what you want. You have to be able to advocate for yourself, um, be able to give something. It's a, not a one-on-one, a -on -one. it's not a just you usurping, I think, things from a mentor, but what can you offer to the relationship? Kind of like this reverse model. What are you sharing? And I think I've done just as much for her as she has done for me over the years, which feels like a, a nice way to have a community um, mentoring model in addition, you know, instead of an apprenticeship kind of model. I really like what you said there towards the end, Bridget, because it reminds me of a program that we're launching um, and we have been for the past three years um, here at my campus. Um, we have a Women's Plus uh, Mentorship Network, and it is a beautiful mix of Women Plus um, individuals um, from all across the campus community. Um, and so it's very interdisciplinary. And just like this, we're sharing our stories of success and or confusion and or hope or support. <laughs> and so we're able to come in and we're able to do things like um, weekly writing groups to hold each other accountable for our uh, promotional trifecta, right? So the research, scholarship, and teaching, we're able to hold each other accountable for meeting those goals. Um, we're able to share our experiences of tenure and promotion. We're able to read books together and come together and do more of like a discussion, um, like in small like book clubs. And that mm -hmm. has been beneficial because we don't just um, open this up to faculty, but also to staff as well as students. And so um, this year we actually started opening up to undergraduate um, students as well, because at first it was just graduate students, um, faculty members and staff. And so now we're opening it up to more undergraduate students who are seeking to understand more things like the hidden curriculum in academia and just, you know, just a plethora of other knowledge um, that mm -hmm. they probably wouldn't just, you know, be privy to just on a day-to-day -day basis. And so that's a, a, a form of mentoring as well that's both um, coaching and um, apprentice as well as reverse. So these things can be combined is what we've been able to find. That's amazing. Yeah, awesome. One size does not fit all. <laughs> so thank you, Crystal. I know other people are putting in the chat. They want to learn more about that, about that program at your institution. All right. And, I can and we, also have our, um, we have our information at the end of the slides too. So you can email Crystal directly to find out more information about that. Exactly. Um, I'm going to go ahead and launch our final poll question for today, and this is about diversity and mentoring partners. Um, and this question has come up quite a bit. Um, can non-Black non faculty mentor and support Black faculty? And at this point, we have an overwhelming sense of yeses. A few maybes. And just giving you guys a few more seconds to answer. All right, and I'm going to end the poll there at about 75% participated. 73% um, of you say yes. 
um, absolutely no no's. Right, Bridget? And I think that is um, 100% That's tweetable, right? I think we could put that out and have a good conversation on Twitter or, um, about, because I think there's a misconception that um, if you're non-Black, you can't, you know, possibly support or mentor Black faculty. And that's far from the case for you all, for us as well. Um, I wouldn't have gotten very far in my career if I only had to rely on Black faculty and um but people have, I think the maybe probably is people have to be educated. They've got to be prepared. They've got to be open um, and knowledgeable about what some of the issues are um, with minoritized faculty, Black faculty in particular with anti-Blackness. And so, yes, you can do it, but you have to come correct, right? <laughs> I think that's what I would say. Excellent. And I do see someone over here in the chat saying that their best support has actually been from a non-Black faculty member, um, which was shocking in the beginning. Um, and so they kind of understand that now. Right. Yeah. Trust is key. Absolutely. In the chat. And right. how do you build so, that? Yeah. How do you build that trust? Right. And that's why doing the work is so important, doing your own work. And I love what you have here, um, Vanessa. I can't see the rest of your last name, but um, it is crazy that anyone would think in in, in this day and age that that it's not possible for um, for non Black faculty um, to mentor um, Black and Brown faculty or faculty of, of color. And not to mention that there's still so few of us that we couldn't possibly mentor all um, of the Black students or all of the other Black faculty. Um, and so we have to have support. We have to have allies. We have to have people who are thinking this is everyone's work and not just putting extra labor on our Black faculty. All right. Well, Allison, are you ready to kick us off into some of these uh, Q&As from our um, participants? Yeah, this is such great discussion here. So much in the chat to keep up with. I'm sorry, I don't think we'll get, be able to get to every single um, comment and question here. But I mean, there are some interesting comments coming up about men and women as well. And if there's um, how to facilitate, I guess, mentoring and, and these kinds of um, relationships with that in mind as well. Yeah, yeah, I think I would follow the chat, but it's the same that, mm -hmm. of course, um, people of any gender can can mentor anybody of any other gender that they have to be prepared to um, be knowledgeable, be trustworthy, build confidence, um, because it's not really about the gender. I think it's about how you approach it and how you perceive other people's gender and how you are gonna be attentive to that. So um, absolutely. Right. And then almost kind of um, seconding um, what a comment over here in the chat is saying a non-Black faculty member um, mentor can be perspective changing. And I, I feel the same way with gender-based identities as well, right? So having a mentor um, of, a, of a different gender identification could actually be perspective changing as well. So I do tend to have one or two um, mentors that are not female identifying um, as well. And that has been very eye opening. Um, and just to see things from, you know, a completely different lens as it pertains to academia. Awesome. Thank you. Yeah, I see one too. I see Nina, Nina here um, posted, I would like to learn more about the apprenticeship model mentoring. Um, if you could speak to that, there were so many great types, so much rich, richness there. Yeah, thank you. Okay, so just kind of going back through the definition of apprentice, um, SHIP model is a guided form of mentoring where the expert mentor um, shares knowledge, skills, resources, sometimes scenario examples um, with their mentee at each major milestone. So one of the ways I think about this is how I've been recently using this with uh, my doctoral students. Um, although, you know, that is a form of mentoring, um, it can uh, work with faculty and staff as well. So as you um, proceed through the different milestones and benchmarks within your tenure and promotion or within your moments of um, moving up within the institution, um, they can pretty much guide you, you know, you, you get to ask them questions, they um, they guide you by, you know, providing exemplars, um, and just kind of walking you through the process, um, not necessarily hand holding, but definitely kind of guiding you through um, each phase so that 
you understand not only what it is that you're doing, but the why behind it. Um, and so that way you obviously have more engagement, more buy-in for it um, as well. And then that kind of helps you become a little bit more successful. So as they share with you um, through their own experience, certain loopholes, they can kind of help you navigate, um, you know, uh, through some of that as well. There's so much expertise here. Thank you. Thank you for sharing that. And great, great chatter um, in the discussion here as well. Uh, I see too this. Thank you, Marcelia, for submitting to the Q&A um, more uh, question about the reverse mentoring model and how to implement it successfully that it might not not always work out for, you know, a more junior person coming to a senior person. Um, but if you have any experience making that work. Yeah, I can speak to that again. Um, it, it really has to be an openness, I think, from from the person who's more senior, maybe tenured or long serving. When I did it, it was with somebody who'd been, you know, at the institution 30 years, full professor, white male, um, and I think the openness to say, hey, this is somebody who recently got their PhD, who is just starting out and has some knowledge about the field and areas that I haven't read in quite a long time, um, has a different identity when, than me, and I want to learn, and is willing to kind of implement. And so this person and I decided to co-teach a course together where we were, you know, collaborating on the syllabus and books, and um, and then this became a process where we would just kind of meet regularly and touch base with each other. And I also believe in intergenerational friendships, that there's some things that I can learn um, as well as they. And I think that if, that if both people are open to it and if, you know, nobody's feeling exploited or used or, you know, like this person's just soaking me up for all my, my all my stuff, but I'm not getting anything back. Um, it worked out, I think, really well. I think that ultimately the students benefited from having our collaboration and our and our work. And I think the program ultimately ben benefited. Excellent. And I really love what you shared at the end, um, not only with my mentoring, um, but also with my teaching. I believe that those things should be very reciprocal in nature. And that's exactly what you're alluding to here um, by stating, you know, it's got to be a little bit of give and take. And so obviously that, that openness um, um, has to be, you know, first and paramount, um, you know, so that the more, like you said, more senior um, faculty member is willing to accept it, is willing to take that, take the understanding that things have changed. Um, and so in order to continue moving forward, we can't have, you know, antiquated ways um, that we continue to do things. Um, so I appreciate you saying that not only do, does there have to be openness, but also that um, uh, reciprocity, right? So yeah, absolutely. Thank you, Marcella. That's a great question. Um, and I know we've got maybe five more minutes before we're going to wrap up here. So what else, Allison, is kind of springing forward for Q&A or in the chat questions? Yeah, I mean, there was so much discussion around that point about seeking out different perspectives um, and how even within students and faculty, those relationships are really valuable. I'm curious if there are um, more examples, too. I know you spoke to this earlier, but of ways to meet others, build those connections, find the organizations and the, the groups. There was a lot of interest in that in that area. I see a question here in the Q&A. Um, can you help us with that one, Allison, from Jane Newman? I'm not seeing it for some reason. Sorry. Um, oh, here it is. Yes, thank you. Yeah, let's see. So yeah, a new faculty member. Thank you, Jane, for posting. Um, so how we how would we suggest we start to gain knowledge to help others, specifically people of color looking for help formally or informally? Um, uh, that idea of like, right, being knowledgeable before you help or mentor, but sometimes mm -hmm. it's hard to know what you don't know. That speaks to the same same sort of question. That's a great question. Thanks. Yeah, one of the things I think that's wonderful is um, Harvard and Michigan and some other folks have these um, assessments that you can take online, um, kind of like equity assessments that you can take, whether they be gender-based or race-based. Um, and so you can go on online and look and look these up or email me and I can send you the, the more information. But so it's a way to kind of assess yourself. And, and I also use something that Beverly Daniel Tatum, um, author of like, why are the black kids sitting together in a cafeteria, um, former president, has done around um, how to kind of interview yourself. Do you like this self-guided interview that takes you through many different social identities and experiences? And then you can kind of look at the results and see, okay, 
you know, maybe I need to focus more on sexual orientation or I need to focus more on my ableism or I need to focus on my, you know, um, classism. And then you can kind of focus and find articles, podcasts, you know, professional development once you have it really tailored, um, because sometimes it's hard to know, like you said, where to begin and where to start. And so those are just a couple of ways that you can do on your own to do your own work, to assess where you are, and then seek out the appropriate resources as needed. And then also just being completely transparent, right? And and honest, like you could you could literally say, I, I don't know, but I'm be I will be willing to find out, or hey, let's go investigate that together. So that way it's more of a partnership moving forward. Um, you know, than than not. And then I think that people will really appreciate someone being completely honest and transparent with them than just saying, you know, just, you know, just kind of giving some random answer as well. Yeah. And my emails are at the end of our slide. So just please email me and I can send you the link to some of those assessments that, that I was talking about. And I can send you the link to the Beverly Daniel Tatum um, one that I use as well. Thank you for that. I'm going to go ahead and share um, my screen um, as we kind of wrap up. Um, so we wanted to um, end this session with some key takeaways. And so we had some key takeaways for faculty, just, um, just for you guys to kind of consider, just always remembering your purpose for entering the um, academy in the first place, and then kind of finding your community and kind of building within that. Um, making sure that you take some time to really understand the structure, um, organizational logistics, um, and any kind of program practices within the academy is really going to set yourself up for success. Um, and then making sure that you're present um, and then, you know, using some of your internal self-empowerment to kind of move you forward. As far as even being brave enough to ask questions, um, it's okay if you don't know. We don't know everything. Um, and it's okay for you to ask, right? And so challenge your mentors um, in, in your department to practice what they preach, right? So they say they want to help. They say they want, you know, these diverse individuals within their institution, have them practice what they preach. And then you know, communicate with your colleagues often, right? And then support them, obviously, when you can. Um, and then just make sure that you kind of persevere. So that's for um, faculty, you know, some things for you guys to consider. But as far as uh, for institutions, there's a lot here. Um, <laughs> um, and that's why you have access to the slides. But, you know, definitely um, making sure that any kind of systematic or institutional um, politics, um, policies and procedures are clearly communicated. They need to be transparent um, and equitably applied. Um, and these, these really kind of need to be the benchmark um, behind decisions that are made um, because any, any room for misconfusion leads to you know, a disaster. And so we really kind of want to avoid that. Um, and then also just uh, provide mentoring and coaching programs for all um, academic roles because we can't forget about um, our staff or our students, right? Because the students are what's making us <laughs> help make a living. So, you know, we have to make sure that we're providing um, good mentoring and coaching across the board. Like I said, you do have access to these slides because our time is slightly running out um, for us to go through all 10 of these. Um, so if you do um, want access to this slide um, deck, we do have a QR code here and Allison has been so gracious to continue to drop that into the chat for you as well. Yeah, right. thank you all so much for, for coming and for asking good questions, for providing resources to each other in the chat and engaging and hopefully um, this will help add to your community um, as well. So thank you and thank you so much, Crystal, for this amazing presentation and resources and Allison, for your assistance throughout. Yeah, I'm not alone here. There's a lot in the chat too. Just can't thank you enough um, for sharing your expertise here. Um, this has been a really informative session. Um, I did just add the link to for joining your next session as we are at time. Um, be sure to check out the agenda on the event website for uh, all the other great sessions happening today. Um, and yeah, I think your invitation to be in touch is huge. So I hope that the discussion here continues. Thank you so much for joining us today. Um, and have you. a great, great rest of your day, everyone. Okay, bye-bye. Dr. Doctors White and Turner Kelly, really, this was awesome. Thanks. <laughs>